Today's postcard is from Bunratty Folk Park in County Clare. Tom, I've been talking to you there and I wish everyone could have heard what we were saying because you were saying some extremely funny things about the chickens and the cock and everything else. Maybe we'll, we'll get well, we won't to repeat that. that. I don't think we should repeat that. <laughs> but this is a fantastic place. What's the vision behind this? The whole idea is really to show people coming into this part of Ireland what life was like in Ireland around the turn of the century, roughly between 1850 and 1920. I suppose it's appropriate to say, showing them what Ireland was like before the advent of radio or indeed television, and people had to make their own entertainment. So we're trying to bring the folk park alive, rather than have it as a static museum setting. That's why we have the hens and the chickens in the farm, we plant our own wheat, we make our own bread, we milk our own cows, that type of thing that brings life to this place. We actually, actually ask people to uh, step back into the 19th century when they come here. So you turn the clock back? Try to turn the clock back. Now, everything here then that we're going to see is what you call authentic? We'll try to make it as authentic as possible. When you have 340,000 people walking through a farmyard, it's not possible to make it 100% correct. There's the whole raft of legislation, particularly under the heading of health and safety, when you're bringing people through. But I'd say most open-air folk parks or museums would get about 80% of it right. And I'd say we're close to that figure here as well. So where are we walking past now in that little garden? Well, strictly speaking, we're in a little chunk of land from the Cashin area, which is a river that flows into the River Shannon. This would have been the house of a fisherman who would have lived there at the turn of the century. And he would have made his living from catching salmon on the Cashin River. Now, this would have been a poor man, even though we're inclined to think of salmon as a luxury dish today. But salmon were so plentiful at that time that, in a sense, in one sense, it was a poor man's dish. And what would we find in there? Inside there, you find two rooms. You have the kitchen and you have the bedroom. The ceiling of the bedroom has canvas sacking covering the rafters and whitewashed, lime washed. And as the years go by, the layers and layers of lime would build up and it would be like a sort of a hard wall now. Both floors are mud floors. This man would have built the house with most of the local materials that he could pick up for nothing, which wouldn't have been a cost to him. It a rammed clay floor, and the floor would have to be put down at a time of year when the weather itself would be starting to dry off, so that the floor could gradually set and dry. If you were to dry too quickly, it would all crack and flake like the surface of the desert after rains. Now, along here we've got some more cottages. That's got smoke coming out of it. What would that one be there? Well, all of the houses, first of all, let me say, we light fires in all of them, and with some sort of an activity going on in them every day. To walk into the farmhouse and find no fire lighting, the house is dead. So the kitchen where you had the heart was really, in every sense of the word, the heart of the house. That particular house now would have been a poor farmer's house from the borders of Limerick and Kerry. And that man might have had plenty of land, but it would be poor quality, mountainy land. And he would have had no one to farm it. He would have had to do this work himself. His wife might well have helped him. If he had some sons or daughters, they would work and help him on the land as well. Even though standing here looking at it with the yellow ochre walls yeah. and the grand quality reed on the roof, one would say, gosh, wouldn't I love a house like that as a summer home? But I can assure you at the turn of the century and the mountainy borders, let's say, between Limerick and Kerry in the wintertime and the rain washing in and you're trying to keep your four bones together, as they would say, it was tough living in those days. And that's what's difficult for people like myself when we move a house and we put it into a setting like a folk park, is to give that feeling of how difficult life was at that time. Most of the visitors coming out now, I'd say, would say that they would love to have that house as a summer home. There's rest. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> This particular one we're approaching now was the very first house that we built here uh, in the folk park. And as you can see, it's a typical farmhouse, whitewashed walls, they're nearly two feet thick. It has a fine stout 
thatched roof, hip thatch on one gable and a high gable wall at the other end so that if they ever wanted to extend the house they could add on another room onto the house right. as the family would get bigger. Whereas if the hip thatch was coming down on both sides it would just cause them more problems when they go to extend the thatch. And where did this particular farmhouse come from? That particular one used to stand directly where the first jet runway was constructed in <laughs> Shannon no. in the late 50s. Goodness it's, me. it's interesting to think that the beginnings are the birth let's say, of Bunratty Folk Park was synonymous with the birth of the jet engine. That's incredible. Because at that time, we were trying to develop overseas traffic coming in from America. We were trying to develop passenger traffic through Shannon Airport. But remember, this was the late 50s. There was a lot of emigration out of Ireland. There was a lot of empty houses along the coast of Ireland with young men going abroad to America, Australia, and particularly to Britain for work. So it was decided by our government at the time to try and develop tourism and to develop Shannon Airport as a gateway for American tourists coming through. And that farmhouse was an old McNamara farmhouse, and it stood where the runway was to be constructed. It's incredible. And that very jet that brings in today's visitors was really the saviour of that house. It's incredible, and, and that really then was the genesis of everything, of the everything, origin. Everything, yeah, for a long time, from about 1960 to 1963, that was the only house we had, and visitors were coming to look at the restored Bonratti Castle and that house. Then we started baking bread in the house. That started to bring it alive, the smell of the baking going through. People could actually sample some of the bread, so we were tapping into the taste buds. It was interpretation, I think, at its best. Then people started to say, why don't you have more of these houses? But that at that time there was no organisation in Ireland for the preservation of vernacular architecture so we decided to take on this chore ourselves and we were the first at it in the 26 counties. Now, what I notice here, Tom, in comparison with the other uh, farmhouses, a lot of grass and lawn in front of the house mm, here. Is mm, that the main difference? Yes, this would be one of the differences. This is actually a prosperous farmer's house. This would be the upper end of the scale of what we saw. This man could afford the luxury, you might call it, of a lawn at the front of the house. He could afford the luxury of a porch on the house. You didn't step straight into the kitchen as you would with some of the other farmhouses. And it's quite a long single storied house. You rarely came across two storey thatched houses in rural Ireland. Again a lot of the timber that was available was only short enough to build a narrow house. Due to the Industrial Revolution, quite an amount of the timber was cut out of Ireland and used to uh, fire the furnaces uh, in Great Britain because we were ruled by Great Britain at that time. So that actually determined the sizes of the houses that could be built in Ireland. So when we come over here then, we have like the monkey puzzle tree, yes. for instance. Yeah which you see is quite an exotic plant. It's isn't called it, the Chilean pine, isn't, isn't it? Isn't it fabulous? So yep. how is it that in the middle of Ireland, OK, a prosperous farmer, why yep. would he have something from South America? That's right. Queen Victoria uh, gave her friends, on occasions, the seeds of monkey puzzle trees. And obviously it was associated then with what one might call the landed gentry. Ah. And the prosperous farmer trying to show that he was probably well in with Queen Victoria, would plant the monkey, monkey puzzle, puzzle tree. In, in his garden, in a sense copying some of the very wealthy landlords that he might have looked up to at the time. You do see that around so many do, places yeah. within the British Islands. Yes, yes. Um, the monkey puzzle, yes. as you rightly call it. What you don't see so often, however, is apple trees in the front in garden. The front, in the front garden, that's <laughs> quite right. Again, this man was a, a man who could afford to put some trees in the front garden, again he would be looking at, I suppose, the social level above him, which again might well be the landed gentry, who would have their own walled garden, and they might have pears, apples, various other fruits and vegetables to feed the household. This man then couldn't afford to go over a full field in doing that, he would need that for his cows and crops, but would have used part of the front lawn to plant some apple trees, which again then would have been used by the banatee or woman of the house baking apple tarts and apple cakes. And inside all authentic again? 
them. Inside them, we try to keep the house as authentic as possible. All of the furnishings, um, the dressers, the mantelpieces, the china cabinets, the beds, the crochet quilts that would go on the beds, the willow pattern uh, delf that would be there. All of that is very much in keeping with the style and the period of that house. So if we're looking at the poor, the not so rich and the rich farmer, how much would they be bringing in a year? Roughly, very, in Victorian difficult, very difficult to put that into money because it wasn't the amount of money they were bringing in. They didn't need to create a lot of money. They needed to exist. They needed to be able to create um, their own food. They might have poor man might have had one cow. He would have milked that cow. That might have been a Dexter cow. It might have been a Kerry cow. Animals that would survive the harsh winters. Animals that could cope with poor quality land but yet could give a reasonable yield of milk. They would have always kept a pig. They would have always kept fowl. The woman of the house would have started to sell the eggs at market. And all of that would generate the income. It wasn't a cash income. We get our cash today and then we go out and we buy the goods. We're the real consumer throwaway society. This is how we are totally different in a sense from let's say my grandparents who would have existed with a small amount of money but would have had most of their food themselves and as you move into parts of Ireland even the clothes that they were wearing the tweeds and so forth would have been made by the woman of the house so they were able to in a sense those living in rural Ireland were sort of self-sufficient in a way that we are not today because we're very much dependent on going out to the corner shop or the supermarket.